thank you. Um, and thanks so much to the conference for having me. This is my fifth or sixth DevOps days in a year. Um, I took a, an advocate position and we start, you know, we do lots of traveling and stuff. So this was my very first one of my very first DevOps days and also my first conference as an advocate last year. And I felt like I was drinking from a fire hose and totally in over my head, having tons of experience with the technology, but not any really with the community. Um, it was really overwhelming and I am just thrilled to be here on stage a year later. So thanks so much for, for having me. Uh, so from time to time in our professional lives, we get thrown into the deep end, right? This is a space where we actually can thrive, we can learn new things, and we can sort of take the opportunity, thrown into the deep end, we come up swimming, we master it, we throw a new tool in our tool bag, and we move on to the next challenge. And sometimes we're really out of our depth. Sometimes getting thrown into the deep end, we don't master it. We don't feel like we're doing well at all. Um, and sometimes this can bring up a lot of anxiety and feelings of inadequacy, even when we succeed. Um, so the idea of sort of being thrown out of your comfort zone and into a new set of challenges that you actually do succeed with, but you sort of feel like you maybe lucked out or maybe you just accidentally succeeded, that's got a name. That's called imposter syndrome. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, my name is Jesse. I am a cloud native advocate at OCI, which is the Oracle Cloud, as if I needed more challenges in my life. Um, that is a, is a challenging brand, but we're doing, we're doing all right. So I focus on containers, Kubernetes, open source things, um, and you know, talk to me about all the, all the things, including social anxiety and imposter syndrome. So when I was a kid, I tinkered a lot. I took things apart and put them back together, um, sometimes with varying results, um, sometimes with uh, hilarious results. The most risky click probably for me was, uh, was the, the X-Wing deconstruction and reconstruction, because that toy when I was a kid was super dope and very rare, but it worked. Um, what didn't work was the speak and spell Teddy Ruxpin thing I tried to do. It was, well, it was just weird. Um, but mostly, you know, I tinkered a lot, and I got into computers at a really early age. Um, so my dad was a systems analyst at a nuclear power plant, was writing Fortran 77 code, um, and he'd bring it home and red pen it on the kitchen table, and I'd, uh, I'd sit alongside with him. And my aunt and uncle, who actually lived in Reading here, uh, started what became the first Microsoft, the first third party Microsoft training center. Uh, so we had like all sorts of stuff, compacts and uh, these, these little compacts, this was a laptop by the way, it was like 26 pounds, for those of you who are younger than me. Uh, Legit, I'm probably screwing around with DOS there or something. Um, so I was pretty lucky and I was surrounded by computers and my dad bought a Commodore 64 when I was eight and uh, I sat down with it over Christmas break and I taught myself basic uh, from the book. And that was pretty rad. And then he brought home accessories like a printer and a cassette drive for storage, but also a 300 baud modem. And he also got us a five digit CompuServe account. And so I could actually use the telephone in my little town in mid coast Maine call New York City for a couple dollars a minute, connect to the BBS before the internet was really a thing, and pull down basic code and play with it and muck with it. And I'd have these games where I changed the name to Jesse because I was the hero. Um, and, and that just, I sort of kept tinkering and kept doing stuff. In my high school, we actually had a SCO Unix box sitting in the math lab that nobody even knew anything about. And I was like, I'll play with that. And the teacher was like, sure, here's the manual. And I, I taught myself C and uh, played around with Unix and I felt pretty cool. Um, so I was really like one of those kids that was early on just into computers and always hacking on stuff. But I was gonna be a chef. That was the plan, that was my career. Uh, since I was a little kid, I just cooked all the time and I loved it. And I don't mean like, you know, Papa Gino chef. I was gonna be like French cookery, full on like people who swear at you and throw saute pans at you, like legit cooking. <laughs> Uh, and I did it, and, and I actually got pretty good. And I was like 21, and I was a round chef at a really well-reputed uh, 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 restaurant, which is like third in, in charge in French Brigade. And I was making like $7 an hour, and I was there 70 hours a week, and it just was pretty crap. And I remembered I liked computers, and I wondered if there was any money in that. <laughs> it turns out there was. So purely on hustle, I got myself a job at Sun Microsystems. 
Now this was 1997 or eight, uh, 98. Uh, and it's fairly unheard of at the time to get into software engineering anywhere, even at a not great place. Sun was like just cream of the crop. It was an awesome place. But this was a really educated and really well-informed hustle that I played. I became a contract recruiter there, wrote my own rec, found a manager I wanted to work for, and then made them hire me. <laughs> so this is not just like any hustle that anybody could do. This was pretty well executed. Uh, but I did it. And I also had the basic skills, right? I could write C code, I kind of knew Unix enough, whatever. Um, and I was, I just, I, I hustled hard. And I bought the entire O'Reilly catalog. Um, <laughs> And I just like read books and I coded and I hacked on shit. But most importantly, I worked like 70, 75 hours a week. And I know we all say that, oh God, I worked 80 hours last week. Y'all ever work 80 hours? Like it's actually really hard. <laughs> and so I'm talking like Saturday night, I was in the lab. Uh, Monday morning, I would be there at seven in the morning. I worked all the time. And that was because I felt like I had this deficit. I had to fill in the blanks, right? So I had to work harder than anybody else around me. These guys had these master's degrees. I worked with a woman who had a PhD. Like this was, whoa, they're smart, I'm not, I gotta work real hard. And I did, I worked really hard. I landed in a test org, which at the time was mostly almost retired tech support people who just like to poke buttons. And I was like, I'm gonna write some code. We were writing kernel software stuff and I actually wrote like a test driver to run in the kernel to test other drivers and people were like, what the hell are you doing? Like stop it. I actually built a self-service cloud with a friend of mine who was like-minded and we wanted to write code. Um, like we built a thing where you could click a button and actually like allocate hardware and run tests. So we went after it really hard. Um, but what I really wanted to do was I wanted to be in development. And I didn't feel like I deserved even the job I had. Uh, I was succeeding, I was doing really well, I was working really hard, I could give people code reviews that was useful, but I felt inadequate. And imposter syndrome is this thing where it manifests as a fear of you being exposed as a fraud. And I actually had a bit of a secret, right? I never lied about not having a college degree, but I never corrected anyone either. Um, and I should be clear about that. They wouldn't say you have one, right? And I said, yes, I never lied about it. It just never came up. It was assumed everyone had them, right? So the problem for me was I really wanted to get in development, but I figured if I raised my hand and said, will you move me to development, they'd realize I was there and just fire me. Like, what are you even doing here, right? <laughs> so what ended up happening is the development manager approached me and asked me if I wanted to join her project as a development lead. And I was like, oh, well, I, okay, I guess I, I can keep the job. And that should have been a clue to me. Right? Not only, I was afraid, I was hiding under my desk about asking for, say, a promotion, a lateral move. They moved me into a lead position. That should have been a hint. But, so spoiler alert, it, it wasn't, right? And I always sort of chased my tail around feeling inadequate. I worked on Solaris, which was a Unix at the height of the Unix wars. We all had our own hardware, our own OSs, our own drivers for everything. I didn't know people didn't write drivers from scratch. I wrote four from scratch, shipped them all, and they're all still shipping in the OS today. They make up the backbone of the IO stack in some applications. And the whole time, I felt like a failure. I felt like a fraud. I felt like I didn't belong there. But I kept going. And I kept getting promotions, and I kept getting salary increases, and I kept getting bigger teams. And that's the thing to note here. Imposter syndrome is a thing where if you suffer from it, you're not crazy. Right? You know you're succeeding. Nobody's fired you. You haven't been shown the door. They didn't take your card away. However, you still feel like at any moment, someone with a clipboard is going to show up and be like, oh, yeah, you were a total mistake, by the way. Pack your shit. <laughs> so success did not feel like success for me. From any sane reckoning, I was successful. right? Um, but I didn't feel like it. And that's the thing. Um, quite the opposite. You end up feeling like the more work you get, the more you have to do, the more you have to push yourself outside your comfort zone, because otherwise, you know, you're gonna, it's just going to be proof that you're not good enough. Right? So you kind of keep taking on more stuff, and you live in this whole realm of never really being comfortable. So I didn't know this was a thing. This is a thing now. You Google it, it's on Twitter, whatever. I mean, we didn't even have Twitter. Like, well, okay, we did, but it was like for talking about Hot Pockets and stuff. Um, <laughs> 
so like, there, there were no thought leaders around this. And about five or six years ago, my wife sent me this link to this article, and she's like, this is imposter syndrome. It's got a name. It's a thing. You know, you should read this. So I put it like away for about three months. I finally read it and I was like, you know, I think I have this like imposter syndrome. And my wife was like, no shit, you think? Um, <laughs> uh, sometimes imposter syndrome is exacerbated or even caused by childhood trauma. Um, it interacts really oddly with anxiety disorders that may pre-exist. Uh, ADHD has very interesting implications in this space. I might just tick all those boxes, just so you know. Um, but I know a lot of people who have similar feelings and have had similar experiences that none of those boxes are ticked. Um, so this really can affect anyone in any walk of life. This is by far not a tech industry thing. It's not even a work thing. I am a parent of two beautiful, amazing children with my wife. And every now and then we sit down after they've gone to bed and we go, all right, we're the parents. I keep forgetting we're waiting for the adults to show up. We're actually them. Yeah, so this can impact you kind of across the board in various ways. So eventually, those of us who survive this long enough, um, we have to admit that we are successful. We have to admit that we have value and that all of the successes sort of pile up and it's proof, it's too much proof to say, well, no, we're not, we don't deserve this, we're frauds, right? Eventually, you have to admit, now this is a thing, but what do we do with it? Right? Where do we go from there? Um, I don't know if anybody's ever done therapy, cognitive-based therapy, talk to people. Sometimes that's actually just the first step and it can make it even harder. When you realize this, then what? So let's talk a little bit about what it is first and how it manifests, and then I hope to share some advice with you around how I've dealt with it. So first and foremost, the idea of imposter syndrome is just that. It's not an excuse for being significantly misaligned with your responsibilities at work. Let's not confuse that. Like you can't be sort of just a, you know, like a front end web developer and be like, I'm gonna do some network socket programming. Like you gotta probably read a book and do some stuff. This is around feeling like you're inadequate and you don't belong after you have provable success. So you feel like literally a little kid playing business, right? You're, you're in there, you're doing it, you're making it happen, but something doesn't quite feel right. Um, relatedly, what happens is that this kind of builds up the system where it's difficult for us to take a compliment. It's hard for us to enjoy accolades. To get a promotion sometimes for me was really stressful and I got them, it happened. I started as a level one engineer and I went all the way up to staff without ever leaving the company. So it happened where I progressed in my career, but I always felt like this. I always felt like, oh, yeah, great, thanks. I'll just be hiding under my desk. Please don't fire me. And a lot of that leads to another telltale sign of what imposter syndrome really manifests itself as, which is shame, right? So it's very normal, especially in tech, to be thrown into the deep end and be out of your element, right? That is how we learn. I mean, you do new things. This is good, keep yourself fresh. The difference is, is when someone who suffers from imposter syndrome is thrown into the deep end of the pool and they don't know what they're doing, they feel shame about it. They feel like they're supposed to know it, they should know it. And we feel like we're supposed to know all the things all the time. And uh, often, ironically, as I said before, it ends up pushing us to take on even more work in that space because we're trying to prove that we belong. We try subconsciously to take on so much work that we become sort of irreplaceable. You can't, you know, just try and replace me. Go ahead and fire me. Nobody's actually trying to fire me. <laughs> so in the worst cases, this can result in exercising and exhibiting self-sabotage and extreme procrastination, right? We can do some really messed up things with these magical things called our brains, right? The human brain is an amazing thing and it has really interesting capabilities of making what we think is truth actually a reality. If you feel like you're a financial wreck, uh, you might not manage your money very well. If you feel that you're inadequate, in your profession, it's quite possible that you, your brain will play tricks on you to the point where yeah, you might just procrastinate and actually blow a deadline. You might say, well, I could do this better, but I just, I don't feel like I'm gonna go out on that branch, right? And you end up sort of self-fulfilling, you're building the self-fulfilling prophecy, which can be really destructive. 
And that's the worst case, but I have seen this. I had a mentee once who literally just nuked his career because he couldn't deal with the amount of imposter syndrome symptoms that he was dealing with. He took six months off, he came back. He's now a manager in a, a very large co uh, company at a really successful group within that company. Uh, but it took him a while to kind of get wrapped around the fact that he was actually causing a lot of those problems himself. So I am not a therapist. I am not a counselor. Um, I am here to share my experience and some advice around this. Uh, and I do suffer from imposter syndrome. So I put the CFP out and the conference uh, said, yeah, sure, that's great. Come on, talk. And I was like, really? I don't think I'm qualified. <laughs> I'm pretty sure on that. Like, is, is there somebody better? Like, anybody? Um, that, so that's my imposter syndrome, kicking up, giving a talk on imposter syndrome, which is just awesome. So let's talk about some things we can do. So one of the most important things that I did in my life was just to start focusing on being positive, to focus on the positive things that people said about me. To sort of stop any time I felt like I was really significantly out of place and turn around and say, okay, here's all the things that I have done that are provable. I have succeeded. No one has fired me. Yes, I feel this way right now. I feel like a fraud. That is okay. I'm going to move on and I'm going to give this talk because I have provable success. This is really important. Bad vibes are bad right? Sarcasm and sort of cutting other people down is just sort of a self-defense mechanism that we might build up. It's kind of toxic, right? So part of being positive is also about finding positivity in other people. And it's amazing when you start throwing out just little comments to people, how much that can click with them. And maybe it starts a conversation where like, you're talking with somebody and they say, you know, I kind of feel like a fake or a fraud. And you say, me too. And they say, whoa, you've got your shit together. What are you talking about? That happens a ton where somebody you compare yourself to actually feels the same way. Another part of this is being brave. Just admitting that it's a thing and it's a thing that impacts your life is a big deal. Uh, we don't like to always sort of give names to issues or anxieties that we have and then to sort of admit that we have them, right? It doesn't define us, but it also there is a certain element of this that has to do with acceptance and just facing it. When we face it head on and we talk openly about it, it tends to take a little bit of power away from that thing. So when we talk about imposter syndrome, we're taking some of its power away and we're owning it. Don't be afraid to not know a thing. This is huge. This is probably my number one go-to thing, having mentored junior engineers and, and you know, people uh, in my teams for a decade. Even before I realized this was a thing, I realized I used to pretend to follow conversations a lot because our imposter syndrome says, if you don't know what's going on in this conversation, that'd be your fault and then you end up with shame around that and just sort of like you don't want to show that. So you end up kind of rushing back to your desk and Googling something, especially if you signed up to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, don't be afraid to be the person in the room that says, um, so what the hell are you talking about? That's fine because what you find out, especially in meetings, is sometimes like 70% of the people don't know what the hell that guy was talking about. And that means he probably didn't know what he was talking about and that's okay, right? We can, you know, because that helps him grow too, right? So being open about just not knowing what the hell is up is just fine. And this relates to conversations that we have in the hallway, at the water cooler, in the hallway track, right? We all know all the things, don't we? Everything. Like when we're talking, it's like, yeah, the Krita Manifram, open source CNCF, blah, blah. Yeah, sure. Like, have you looked at the CNCF landscape? Yeah, you don't know all those things. Like, no, I, I, Chris Anichek doesn't know all those things. Like, not every, it's like, you don't have to know all the things. And when we sort of nod and sort of push through things that we don't know, we sort of miss an opportunity to learn about those things sometimes, right? I mean, yeah, you can go Google it, but maybe it turns out you're talking to one of the maintainers of a project, and that's a connection that you're going to get maybe because you say, well, I don't know what that is. What is that? Oh, I'm really excited to talk about it. Let me tell you. Right? You're not going to know all the things. The most important thing is that you know it's okay if you don't know all the things. 
And that brings us to fear of missing out, FOMO. Just cancel it, ignore it, just, just push it to the side. This is a thing, it's gonna happen. You can't make it not there. What you can do is not nurse it and foster it and make it your pet. And this is what we do a lot, especially when we're like got the Twitter going and we got the tech feeds flying at us and we're like, oh, there's 15 new open source projects. Or, you know, in case of one of the spaces that I focus on, there's three new service meshes this week. Yay, everybody needs that, right? Like, we can't stay on top of everything. And not staying on top of everything is fine. Because for your job, if you need to know about a thing, you'll know about it. I mean, if you're working on, like, static monolithic page applications on the web, you're going to know about Gatsby, right? Like, you're not going to miss it, right? And if you do miss it, maybe you don't need it. And if you hit a problem that you don't have a solution for, then you go a googling and maybe you find something, right? That's how it works. We don't have to know all the things, and FOMO is part of trying to know all the things. Just let that go. And one of the ways that our FOMO really kicks into high gear and gets us into negative places is through social media. Now, for me, this was a particularly interesting aspect of my discovery around this. Is I realized over the course of a year or two, after realizing I had imposter syndrome, FOMO was a thing, I'm like, wait, why am I following all these people that I'll never meet? And actually, when I look at all their stuff on Instagram and Twitter, I end up feeling like crap afterwards. That's probably not cool. And this isn't news, right? Like, we all in this room know that social media can be a little dangerous, right? If you look at all these perfect lives, which we all know are not perfect, and we compare ourselves, even subconsciously, as we're spinning through and looking at things for three and a half seconds each. That can be really toxic. So I'm not saying don't use social media, but maybe if this resonates with you, maybe call some of those, uh, you know, some of those channels and some of those content providers that, that make you feel a certain way. Um, here's, here's a good one. This is really obvious, but this is one of the last pieces of advice that I came on through talking with people about this, and it's a really obvious one. Um, so if they hired you, let's just presume that they did that on purpose. <laughs> right? And that's kind of a big deal. Like, so you went, you did some whiteboard leak code, and they were like, yeah, cool, we ran you through the ringer, here's a laptop, here's a YubiKey, you can push to prod. They probably meant that, right? <laughs> so, and you took a job with them, so let's assume they know what they're doing. Right? And just say, maybe just do the job. Right? And this goes for you know, that grad program that you applied for and got into. Goes for that conference you applied to and got a talk accepted at. Like maybe they know what they're doing. Because what's the alternative, right? I'm gonna say the DevOps Days Boston conference, uh, the, the talk reviewers, they don't know what they're doing? Of course they do. This has been a great conference, right? They know what they're doing. Uh, Stanford knows what it's doing, taking another grad program. And your company knew what it was doing hiring you. So just sort of accept that, and maybe let that be the first provable success, right? <coughs> Last, sort of know that this is a pretty big tribe. This is a thing that we're like, you know, speaking of social media, flip it on its head and go looking for people who feel maybe some of these thoughts, right? You'll find them, because <laughs> there's a lot of them. It's said that probably three out of four people will experience symptoms of imposter syndrome at some point in their careers or in their lives. That's a, that's a lot of us, right? So know that if you feel this way, you're not alone. And a lot of the things that I've said have worked for me are things that have worked for a lot of people. You know, I've now since gone and done the Googling and read the blogs and watched the YouTube videos and I was like, hey, that's kind of what I went through and that's how I dealt with it. And there is a lot of people out there at every level of this sort of dealing with this. Um, and people from all walks of life, uh, from different careers, uh, different ages, different parts of the world. And part of, part of knowing that is, is maybe connecting with that community. Maybe sharing your story, maybe getting, maybe, okay, so maybe not doing a conference talk to share your story, like maybe that's a little bit out there, but like maybe just find a person to chat with, have a coffee, um, like I said, it's pretty amazing how often we open up about this and the person you're talking to is like, oh my God, me too. I thought you were like the shit and now, you know, so it's like, this is a good thing. Because again, now we're taking power away. Because if like, if I'm not wrong and you're not wrong, then it's wrong, right? So that's a pretty powerful thing. 
So get out there, get out of your own head, and maybe just sort of experience this with other people. Mentoring is a great thing. Giving code reviews, we, we shoot a lot of stuff down. Find a really nice little piece of code. I just feel like, that's awesome, I love how you did that. Now, now here's the eight, eight things you have to fix. Um, that's fine, but just give, give some positive in there, because it can be really impactful. The more we share and the more we process around this, the more that we all start to realize that we're really in this together and that we all deserve to be here. So thank you. What are you doing with those mics? They're questions? I, I'm not qualified for that, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> We have time. I, leave, I, I, leave I would to the group. I would be Are happy. There any questions? If you don't mind waiting for the mic, just so that's uh, also on record. Yeah. Uh, first, thanks. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, so, like, I guess probably like almost everyone in this room, I deal with imposter syndrome fairly often. Uh, but I think over time, my take has changed a little bit. I think it, there's a lot of good that comes out of it. A lot of pushing me forward, like you mentioned, like you probably wouldn't have learned as many things as you learned if you weren't pushing yourself. Mm -hmm. So do you have any comments on like the good sides of imposter absolutely. syndrome? Absolutely, yeah, the, absolutely. I've thought that before. I actually left that out of this talk. I do believe I wrote in, into the talk that very thing. Um, people that are coming new to it or just realizing they're experiencing these symptoms, I tend to not go that route because I don't, I don't want to give the I don't want to give it any power, but you're absolutely right. Uh, it is part of what drove me to build the career that I have. It's part of what made me learn so much. The power for me comes from being able to benefit from that and then realizing, okay, the other stuff wasn't that great. The constant low ebb anxiety that I lived through, which I'm sure you can identify with, not, not so great. Um, feeling like, yeah, on like a Saturday, I really got to go into the lab for a few hours and learn that thing that nobody's asked me to learn about just mm -hmm. in case. Maybe that's not that great. Yeah, learning new things is great. Being driven to do it because you're, you're afraid to not, that's where we have to really sort of draw that line. And that can get really unhealthy. And like I said, it can get to a point of really destructive stuff, uh, which thankfully I, I didn't get to uh, too far down that road. Um, and hopefully you didn't either. And I think that's, that's where we can catch it and say, okay, this is motivating, this is great, it's actually pushing me forward. Having a little fire behind your ass is probably good. Um, feeling like you're on fire, not so much, right? So I think, yeah, it's, it's just having that balance, having awareness around the negative side effects is really empowering. We got a question over there. Hi, I just wanted to ask you, do you feel uh, this not only in your career, but also in your life, because I feel I need to do 100% in all areas. Yes. Is that normal? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> and how do you deal with it? So the financial ruin <laughs> thing, uh, so yeah, that was me. Um, <laughs> so, and, and also the parenting is, ve is very challenging, because uh, yep. those, are, those are little people that are now actually big people, like my daughter's almost my height, and it scares the crap out of me <laughs> that I've done the wrong thing, I've guided her the wrong way. She gets straight A's, she's in honors classes, she's beautiful, she has tons of friends, um, and she's uh, mildly athletic. So these, okay. <laughs> Love her to death. So she, she is, uh, and, and she is her own person. I'm not saying that she is my success, but I can apply these guidelines and say, that's provable success parenting. Let's just take a little faith that we did something right, she's not a wreck, and in fact, she's thriving. So I think that that's important. I think it's a tricky thing where if you have these feelings and these anxieties and then you actually do have problems that you have to address, that's an even more difficult thing. You know, I luckily, I, I succeeded. I, I could have actually just ended up under a bad manager and been fired, right? And, and it would maybe had nothing to do with me. So children are their own thing. Financial, you know, tides are their own thing. You can't control everything. So I think again, sort of like when we take the positive with the negative, we have to identify sort of what we own and what we don't and watch for the negative side effects of that. It's good to have some awareness that parenting is important. Feeling like you're a failure when you have provable success, that's the part we want to avoid. So yes, I absolutely 
do? Hi. Hi. Check. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but there's a little difference between three millimeters and seven millimeters. Lead vocalist, everyone. <laughs> the mentee that took time off, who made that call? Did he or she make the call? Did you as a mentor make the call? How did that happen? So very specific information here, but I think it's a really good question. Uh, at Sun, we had a PIP, a performance improvement plan process. We have six months of being on that before anything happens. Uh, you're, you're underperforming and there are issues. Um, so before that process was triggered, I said, let me, because, oh, we also had a really strong mentorship program, not the same team. I was in touch with that person's manager uh, frequently. She informed me that she was thinking about a PIP for him, and I said, hey, let's, let's take a pause on that and let's dig into what's going on. At that point, he admitted we had, he had some type of misalignment, something was going on, and then from there, he did leave the company, we stayed in touch, he took about a half a year to put his head back together, realized that he was just in a, a pretty negative place, started identifying that stuff, and then went on and rebuilt his career. And, uh, is it actually taught, he speaks too. <laughs> so, yes. Here's, here's my sad responsibility uh, to be on time. Uh, the next session is happening now, uh, should be happening shortly, but before you start moving, uh, first let's thank Jesse for being there. Thank you. Thank you all.